Uh, my name is Courtney Beal. I'm the Chief Curator and Deputy Director for Curatorial Affairs here at Healthcare Museums, and it is my honor to welcome you all here this evening for our exciting lecture. Uh, tonight we have a real treat in store. Our Curator of History and Decorative Arts, Shannon Browning Mullis, will be speaking to us about the fabulous exhibition that she's put on view upstairs in the galleries here in this building. Uh, Savannah Families Abroad, The Consumption of Culture in the 19th Century. Um, so this show is very special for many reasons. But for me, the greatest thing about it is that we really mined the collection and dove, dove deep into the museum's history and the history of the people associated with our early years and found objects that in many cases have never been on view to the public before and was able to find these many beautiful objects and use them to really be this evocative story about this idea of families abroad traveling through Europe and the interactions between um, between Europe and the United States in the early years of our country. So uh, we're very much looking forward to it. Um, before we kick that off, I wanted to point out that we also have a wonderful exhibition of photography opening tomorrow over at the Jetson Center, The Language of Vision, that looks at early 20th century photography from the permanent collection and includes a whole portfolio of works that has never been on view before. So I hope you'll come to check that out. Uh, and of course, coming up in September, on September 27th, we'll have the members opening for the long-awaited exhibition, Monet's Matisse, Masterworks of French Impressionism from the Dixon Gallery and Gardens. So I put that on your calendars. And uh, please, for the members among you, I hope you will RSVP early, because we do anticipate that that event will sell out. So please reach out to our membership department and secure your place. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Good evening. Um, I wanted to start tonight by uh, thanking, thanking our assistant curator of decorative arts, Cindy Summers. Uh, she and I put this exhibition together, and I definitely couldn't have done it without her. So thank you, Cindy. Um, so tonight, I want to talk to you about the consumption of culture in the 19th century. And we're going to think about that mostly through the idea of travel, specifically European travel. But also, I want to touch a little bit on Orientalism as well. Now, we're gonna look at this through the lens of the families in our institutional history, so mostly the Telfair family, but also the Owens-Thomas family and the Minas family. So the Telfairs, like many Southern families, did not like to stay in the South during the summer. Uh, you might have noticed it gets a little warm here. They also had insects to contend with and a lot of illnesses that were mosquito-borne. So Savannah specifically in 1820 had a yellow fever epidemic that killed 10% of the population. Uh, and there were other epidemics of that kind over the years. So if you could afford to leave town, you often did. Uh, they went north, they would go to Philadelphia, to New York, but also to resort towns like Saratoga and Newport. The image that you see here is of Newport, in fact. Uh, but they also traveled abroad, particularly to Europe. So the Grand Tour experience in the beginning was very much a British exercise. Uh, wealthy British families were completing the education of their sons by sending them on a tour of the continent. Uh, their educations had mostly begun with private tutors, and they would follow that with trips to study classical architecture and European culture. Most of the times we can think of these people going definitely to France, also so to some Italian cities uh, like Rome and Venice, but there really was no set itinerary. People were traveling to different places depending on their interests, their means, and their companions. So by the 18th century, we have American men and women uh, joining these traditions of travel as well. So admittedly, we're using the term grand tour a little loosely. Uh, we're thinking about travel of wealthy American elites in the 19th century throughout Europe. Most of the information we have about these tours come from travel journals. Uh, people wrote a lot when they traveled. They wrote for their own memories to share with friends, and many of them also wrote with the intention of publishing their journals. And you can tell, uh, depending on whose work you're reading, kind of who they intended the audience to be. In our case specifically, most of what we know come from the journals of Mary Telfair and of William Brown Hodgson. 
their journals were not intended to be published, so you get a less self-conscious look at what they were really thinking and experiencing. Luckily for us, we also get a good amount of detail about their itineraries uh, and the people they encountered through these journals. So travel wasn't easy uh, when the Grand Tour originally became popular. We see in a lot of these accounts complaints about roads specifically. Um, there was not centralized road work and road building the way we think of it today. And the first major improvements come with what you see here. Private turnpikes, toll roads being built uh, by private individuals starting in England and then expanding out into the rest of Europe. The next real advance we see in this kind of travel is stagecoaches. So stagecoaches, called stagecoaches because they go in stages, stopping to change out and get fresh horses, which could be done in two minutes, changing out a team of horses. I think that's pretty impressive. Um, so obviously, if you get fresh horses, you can go on very quickly, and inns started to pop up along the way to provide that changing station. So you're changing horses there, you also have accommodations, and it's a place that travelers can get refreshments along their journey. The next advance comes with the mail coach, which is what you see here. The great thing about the mail coach and the reason that they became so highly sought after is because they don't have to stop for toll roads and everybody else has to give them the right of way. If you look on the back of these mail coaches, you'll see somebody has a trumpet or a horn. Uh, they would blow those when they approached the toll and uh, toll road and they had to open up the gateway and let them go straight through. These are become pretty exclusive because they only had a few spots. And we have a lot of accounts of visitors who really enjoyed traveling this way. Um, they got to entertain themselves by talking to the people they were traveling with and often had the opportunity to practice other languages, particularly French, with the other people who were traveling along the way. But by the 19th century, we get steamships, which change everything. Uh, this is the Savannah, it left out of the port of Savannah, its namesake city in 1819, and it was the first steamship to cross the Atlantic. Now it's another 30 years or so before steamships could reliably take people all the way across the ocean, but this is the beginning. In addition to transporting people, there are a lot of things being transported. Uh, people took a considerable amount of luggage with them, and they also bought a lot of things on their trips. Uh, many souvenirs were purchased, and as you can see here, they often shipped those things back home rather than taking them on from place to place. So these are fragments of a crate that were found, was found at the Owens Thomas house, and you can see that we don't have all the pieces, so we don't have all the details, but this one does say Miss Owens Steamer, and the other piece says Miss Owens Savannah, Georgia. Unfortunately, in the case of the Owens Thomas house, quite a number of Miss Owenses live there. So we don't actually know who this belonged to or exactly the date it came from. But keep in mind, uh, with the transporting of this kind of luggage and these packages, it would have meant also a large number of servants to make that happen. This is your typical luggage in the 19th century. This has been very generously loaned to us from the Juliet Gordon Lowe birthplace, so we thank them for that. Um, but it's slightly different than your suitcase on wheels today that comes through the airport. Uh, they are going on these trips for months, sometimes even over a year, um, and it takes a considerable staff to make this happen. We also have uh, more specific forms of luggage. This is a dressing case that belonged to Dr. James Gray Thomas uh, of the Owens Thomas House. He was a surgeon in the Confederate Army during the Civil War, and after the war, he married Margaret Thomas, who was the daughter of George Owens. Margaret Owens, I'm sorry. So if you take a look at this case, it's wonderful for all the different small implements that you see in it. There are brushes, there are tweezers, there are little containers for all your toiletries. And it's even engraved with James Thomas, MD. Now, as you travel throughout Europe, um, we talked about the varying quality of the roads. The accommodations also varied in their quality, and people couldn't be sure exactly what to expect at some destinations. So we find that they took very specific items with them, depending on what was important for their comfort. Uh, as you can see here, we have a little tea service, which has a teapot, a creamer, and a sugar, all in a handy carrying case. And not surprisingly, it was manufactured in England, because the English do not leave a good cup of tea to chance. Uh, so I guess they carried it wherever they went. 
We also have this wonderful travel set, which is a fork and knife in a case uh, made of sterling ivory and leather, which allowed travelers to enjoy their meals in style and ease wherever they were. Now, I did mention that we would be thinking about a considerable staff uh, to make these kinds of journeys happen. Obviously, inns, taverns, trains, coaches had their own staff of servants available. Uh, we also know that some Americans on these journeys hired people for parts or all of their trips to accompany them and, and make it an easy transition. But we do have complaints from Southerners uh, who did not enjoy the European service and preferred the service of the people who they enslaved at home. And in fact, we know that often uh, Southern Americans took enslaved people with them on these journeys uh, to serve them while they were there. So let's talk about particulars. I want to introduce you to the Telfair family. Uh, the ladies you see here are the Telfair sisters, Mary, Sarah, and Margaret. Uh, they were the daughters of the, gov uh, the governor of Georgia, and because of that, they grew up with a good deal of privilege. They were educated in the North. They stayed with their family friends, the Fuse, while they were educated in the North. And they formed lifelong friendships between the Few Sisters and the Telfair Sisters. I'm um, sure it was lovely for them, but it's especially great for us today because it's mostly the letters between them that tell us so much about the day-to-day -day lives of the Telfair Sisters. Sarah Haig, who you see in the center here, married uh, George Haig in 1815, but both her husband and her young son died within a year of her marriage. So she was back in the Telfair mansion with her sisters. Now, Alexander Telfair, who was the final Telf Telfair brother, passed away in 1832, leaving his sisters here in the Telfair mansion alone. Uh, and they lived a, a relatively retired life. They really didn't entertain and socialize all that much by the standards of the society they lived in. And one thing that's very surprising to me when we really started to do this research, they didn't travel much. Mary uh, has a voracious appetite for knowledge and culture, and, and that really caught me as unusual. But she was also very traditional, very conservative, and it looks like she just was not comfortable traveling without a man. So she writes to Mary Few in 1834, and she says, we deeply regret, dear Mary, that we cannot be with you this summer. Inconveniences attending leaving home seem so great. We have no one to depend upon, and you know it's a great distance to go. We have no enterprise, and our feelings revolt at the idea of throwing ourselves in any way upon strangers. A few years later, she was in luck. Frances Few Christie, another of the Few sisters, and her family, had decided to go to Europe, and they took the Telfair sisters with them. So at the respective ages of 50, 49, and 44, Mary, Margaret, and Telfair, and uh, Mary made their first trip abroad. Now, because these voyages lasted months, by nature they affected the lives of both enslaved and free servants, whether they were left behind or taken with them. Um, in Mary's case, in the 1841 journey, she uh, made arrangements for her domestic and slave servants, so the people who lived in this house, to be leased out to her relative, uh, William Haversham. So you see George Gibbons here, uh, as well as Judy, who's Tel Mary Telfair's cook. Judy's daughter is not pictured. Her name was Kumba, and she was George Gibbons' wife. The three of them uh, were leased out to William Haversham, and each of them got $1 a month in wages. The Telfair sisters received the other $17 of their wages as profit. We also know that on this first journey, Mary did take an enslaved servant with her because her passport reads, Miss Mary Telfair and two sisters attended by a servant. We don't know for sure who that person was, but it is pretty likely that it was George Gibbons' brother Friday who also lived in this house. So the group sailed in November 1841, and they landed in England, continued uh, Poach Coast, as was in style, to Southampton. They spent four days sightseeing in England and then continued on to France. They then traveled to Paris, checked into a hotel, and met the visitor that would change their lives. William Brown Hodgson was in Paris on his way from Washington to Tunis, where he was gonna take up his long sought after post as Consul General. Hodgson is a fascinating character. He's one of the most interesting people in our institutional history. 
Uh, he grew up in Virginia. He lost his father at a very young age. And he did not attend college, but he was tutored by Reverend James Carnahan. This same man became the president of the College of New Jersey, which became Princeton University, and he offered Hodgson uh, an honorary degree from that institution. Now, while Hodgson was being tutored by him, he lived in the home of an attorney that you may have heard of, Francis Scott Key. So from a very early age, he was attracting the attention of a lot of powerful people in the country. It also came, became apparent at an early age that he was incredibly skilled at learning languages. He completed Lucian's dialogues in Greek and Latin when he was 13 years old. And uh, he was recruited early on into the Foreign Service by Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams. So in 1826, he had his first assignment in Algiers in the Barbary States, and he was to assist the Consul General. He was serving as acting consul because the consul then became ill and he thought he was gonna get that post permanently, but it didn't pan out. Instead, he was sent to Constantinople to secure a treaty with the Turks that were running the Ottoman Empire. He completed that mission and then uh, was assigned to work for the consul general as an interpreter in Constantinople. In 1834, he had a secret mission uh, to Egypt where he was to observe the Pasha and decide if trade relations were possible. And he traveled to other places, including uh, to the Peru-Bolivian conference to negotiate a treaty in Lima. So if you take a look at this map, it shows all the places that he went on behalf of the United States government. The places in red, he held official positions, and the ones in yellow, he was traveling through prof for professional purposes, maybe carrying out a task here and there, but he didn't have an official posting in that spot. Today, it looks like, hey, you're a well-traveled guy. In the 19th century, this is pretty incredible. Um, he spent a lot of time in Africa, he's spending time in the Middle East. So finally, in 1841, he got his long sought after first post as Consul General to Tunis. He was on his way there when he stopped in Paris. When Margaret Telfair and William Brown Hodgson arrived that November, she's traveling, he's on his way to his new job. She was 44 years old and he was 40. And it doesn't look like either one of them had considered marrying before that. I think they changed their mind. So after a whirlwind courtship, she agreed to marry him, or in his words in his journal, she accepted the offer of his affections. They were good Victorians. Um, but there was a condition. Margaret Telfair would not live in North Africa. So Hodgson went on to take up his post in Tunis. Margaret traveled with her sisters to Switzerland. After Switzerland, they went to Italy, and from there Hodgson joined them and wrote to uh, Secretary of State Daniel Webster and President John Tyler resigning his post. He did mention that although Margaret would not live in North Africa, they would be very happy to serve at any post in continental Europe or in England, but unfortunately, neither of those panned out. So this is the first journey of the Telfair sisters. Uh, after Hodgson and Margaret married, the Christie family, uh, Francis's few family, went back to the United States. The Hodgsons and the Telfair sisters continued their travels. They traveled through England, Ireland, Scotland, and revisited Paris as well. Now, they did take in the traditional museums and arts along the way, but Mary's interest really focused on religious destinations. Uh, she sought out cathedrals, abbeys, clergymen, and she visited with this man, the Reverend William Jay, who was a famous nonconformist pastor in England, and interestingly, the father of the man who designed both the Telfair Academy and the Owens Thomas House. Uh, we have in her records her account of this visit. She does not mention the fact that his son designed these buildings at all. Which I find so intriguing. It really makes me wonder if she knew or if at the time that Alexander commissioned the house, that kind of work was just so outside her daily life that it didn't matter to her. Uh, but she did write to her friend Mary Few describing her visit with Reverend Jay. She said, we sat an hour with him and I was charmed with his conversation, his countenance and his manner. He talks in the most unstudied style and you never forget for a moment his sacred calling. For his looks and talk, uh, and he talks like a minister of the gospel. So in October 1842, after 11 months abroad, the group heads back to Savannah. And this is roughly the Savannah they're gonna encounter when they get home. 
Uh, a lot of people were surprised at Margaret Telfair's marriage. I don't think they expected her to marry. And we have a letter between George Jones and George Colick where he says, what is thought of Miss Margaret Telfair's marriage? I presume it must have caused much surprise. The ladies of a certain age are carrying everything before them and are certainly the greatest bells. But news traveled outside their fashionable circles as well. Mary wrote to Mary Few describing uh, the encounter with the enslaved servants when they got home. She said, they greeted Mr. Hodgson with great cordiality and were glad to see him look so old for gossip had spread its wings very widely in this direction. Some pronounced him to be 22, while others stopped at 35. So Hodgson quickly settled into life here in Savannah with the Telfair sisters. And they commonly uh, traveled north in the winter, in the summer, as we said. And they traveled to Europe three more times in their lives. The next time is in 1851. 10 years after their first voyage. This time it's Mary Telfair, Margaret Telfair Hodgson, and William Brown Hodgson because Sarah Telfair Haig had actually passed away by this point. This is the passport they took with them. Slightly different than the ones we carry today. This time they traveled aboard the steamship Franklin. They made the journey from New York to France in 12 days. That's not bad. Before steamships, it was generally 25 to 30 days to make it across the Atlantic. They visited France, the Low Countries, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Italy, and England before returning home 15 months later. When the Telfair Hodgson Trio returned to Europe this time in 1851, they took George Gibbons along with them on this trip. So you can see everybody who went with them there on the side. He saw things that most enslaved people never got a chance to see. He was also away from his wife and daughter for over a year. The ship that you see here is the steamship Arctic and it is the one they returned to the United States on in August, 1852. Their third excursion was briefer, it lasted only five months. They traveled via the steamship Atlantic, which you see here. Because Hodgson had been chosen as the commissioner from the state of Georgia for the Paris Exposition of 1855. It's a quaint little gathering. Still, they managed to squeeze in visits to England, France, Germany, and Switzerland. The Telfairs, like most of their contemporaries, always left uh, the United States via New York. They didn't leave from Savannah. And they had an option on their way there and back of taking a uh, railway or steamship and Mary always chose coastal travel. She was quoted as saying, the steamers now are like floating hotels, so comfortable and so much cleaner than the Collins line. Their final voyage in 1866 lasted 10 months. They only visited France and Spain. The group departed for France in July 1866 aboard the steamship Napoleon III. And we all know travel can be exhausting. By this point, they were 75, 69, and 65 years old, and very likely exhausted from the stress of the Civil War and feeling a little bitter at the outcome. Margaret Hodgson uh, wrote home to a friend, Paris is filled with Americans. We only associate with Confederates, with the exception of the Gallatins, who returned to New York next month. I was interrupted a few mo moments since by a visit from an old Boston acquaintance excuse me, acquaintance. She greeted us so affectionately that for a moment I forgot she belonged to Yankee land. <laughs> so on this trip, the group chose more relaxing activities and quiet reflection over a lot of the sightseeing um, from the trips before. They returned home aboard the steamship Europe in May, 1867. Now, European art artifacts and furnishings were finding their way into American household via the Grand Tour. Uh, the Telfairs had a particular interest in Italian artworks and tended to bring a lot of that work home from their travels. Specifically, during their 1851 tour, it looks like Mary went on a little bit of a shopping spree. Uh, she met an art dealer named Petrini and bought at least four works from him. Among them is this portrait, which is said to be Mary Magdalene. Uh, Petrini assured Mary that this portrait was at least 100 years old, placing its creation in the 18th century, and art historians tend to agree with that assessment. She also acquired this 18th century Italian work called Flora from Signor Petrini. A note on the back of this frame in Mary's handwriting says Flora. 
purchased by Mary Telfair from Petrini in Florence in November 1851, said to be an old painting of the Bologna School. Or this, another possible image of Mary Magdalene. A handwritten inscription on the canvas reads, a Magdalene said to be 100 years old, purchased by Mary Telfair of Petrini in Florence, November 1851. Art historians believe this piece could actually be as old as the 17th century, so Mary would be pleased with that. This piece comes to us with the note, a portrait of Catherine de Medici, purchased by Mary Telfair in 1851, said to be an original and sold by the Vespucci family, certificate given to me that it was 300 years in the Vespucci Gallery in Florence, Mary Telfair. Turns out it's not quite that old and it's also probably not Catherine. She was alive from 1519 to 1589. This seems to be a 17th century portrait of Vittoria di Valrova, uh, Grand Duchess of Tuscany. An additional portrait seems to be of the same person, also from the 17th century. Both these are attributed to the Flemish, Flemish artist uh, Sustermans, who served as court painter to the Medicis, and it's unclear whether they were actually painted by him or copies of paintings by him. Other 17th century portraits appear in the Telfair collection that were purchased abroad, but we can't be sure who they were purchased from including this lady from Milan, or this one, which stands out a little more for its subject than anything else. It's the only gentleman we know of that she purchased abroad. This one stands out for a different reason. It was actually painted in 1840, which is later than most of the works Mary acquired, but she bought it in Venice, and I have to wonder if she bought it because she loved Venice so much. Uh, she wrote, Rising with her tiara of proud towers, it seems like the embodiment of a dream. For everything is dreamy in it. A universal stillness reigns. Its streets are canals, its coaches gondolas. Mary's collection also included landscapes that were purchased abroad. These are 19th century copies after 17th century paintings by Salvatore Rosa. Two of the originals are in European museums, one in Spain and one in Rome. But in addition to acquiring uh, art abroad of other subjects, the Telfairs preferred to be painted abroad as well. This miniature of Hodgson was created in Paris in 1842, the same year he married Margaret, and it was painted by uh, the painter to the Spanish royal family. The miniature of Mary was painted in Italy the same year. Margaret commissioned this marble medallion in Rome in 1852, the one on the left, it was created by an English artist named Shakespeare Wood who was studying in Rome at the time. And eight years later, Mary commissioned a Polis artist traveling through the South to create the one on the right so they could be a pair. Uh, you can see them today downstairs in their drawing room, which now houses our mansion to museum exhibition. Other families brought back souvenirs as well. John Wallace Owens of the Owens Thomas House purchased these in uh, Bohemia in 1857. He bought four sets of this beautiful bohemian glassware. Uh, he kept two of them for himself. He gave one to his brother, George Savage Owens, and he gave the other one to his three sisters to share. Many other things uh, were purchased abroad as souvenirs, specifically uh, items that were created in miniature of famous works of art. Like this small 19th century bronze figurine of the dying Gaul, uh, it recreates the marble statue in Rome, which dates from the first or second uh, century of the Common Era, but that statue is very likely a copy of a Hellenistic bronze from around 230 BCE. Or the Staffordshire statue of the Three Graces. Are these sculptures of Narcissus and Echo? They all date back to the 19th century, but these may be my favorite maybe because of how popular they are with tourists. Uh, the original lines were created by Antonio Canova in 1792 for the tomb of Pope Clement VIII at St. Peter's Basilica. They're actually quite large. These are not. Uh, these were created for travel, and they're wonderful because two of them belong to Margaret Thomas of the Owens Thomas House. They were uh, left to us through her family. The other one comes to us from Mary Telfair. We also know that, that people had more 
affordable ways of uh, remembering their visit. Margaret Gray Thomas, who passed away in 1951, and is the person who willed us the Owens Thomas house, traveled widely, and she brought these menus back with her from Paris to remember her trip. The Minus family, a local Savannah family, also contributed to our collection of European decorative arts with their travels. J. Florence Minus and Louisa Porter Minus traveled through Europe after their marriage in 1890, purchasing furnishings along the way. Uh, Louisa Porter Minus commissioned these beautiful Art Nouveau plates in Bohemia that year, and they're wonderful. They all, uh, there are 15 of them, and they depict different animal scenes in these wonderful, bold colors. She also purchased this Maelica urn, which was uh, likely on a honeymoon stop in Italy, and even brought back furniture. Uh, this inlaid mother of pearl table, also Italian. Back to the Telfairs and Hodgson. Hodgson lived an active intellectual life once he made it back to Savannah. He didn't stop studying different cultures and languages uh, when he got here. Not a lot of people realize that about a third of the people who were enslaved on plantations in this area were Muslim. Many of them were literate, but nobody noticed because when they wrote in Arabic, it didn't look like any writing they'd ever seen before. Uh, so Hodgson would go out to plantations and interview these people and ask them about where they came from and their religion and their writing. Uh, he spoke 13 languages, which you see listed here. It's really incredible because you can see that to speak all the languages he spoke, he had to have known seven different alphabets. Find that completely mind blowing. So he's studying lots of different uh, subjects. Unfortunately, his interaction with people on plantations did not lead him to feel that maybe the whole system was a bad idea. He did manage the Telfair plantations once he moved back to Savannah as part of the family. He published all of these works and a few others. So he published on topics like ethnography, linguistics, geology, a vast array of topics. And he became a curator of the Georgia Historical Society, a member of the American Philosophical Society and the American Orientalist Society. He was elected to the geographical societies of two countries, the Asiatic societies of two countries and the ethnological societies of three countries. Not bad. Uh, a lot of these things were probably written and these studies probably done in his study upstairs of the Telfair Mansion, which you can see we've recreated today as part of this exhibit. Now, we began with the idea of consuming culture through the phenomenon known as the Grand Tour, but I'd like to turn briefly uh, to a different form of cultural consumption, Orientalism. This became part of this exhibition because William Brown Hodgson, like many intellectuals of his day, were avid Orientalists. Uh, interested in studying the Middle East, North Africa, um, and other regions. So the term Orientalism describes the stereotyped representation of the East that developed out of colonial uh, attitudes. Imperialism increased Western exposure to people around the globe by the 19th century, and American and European imaginations were constructing ideas about other cultures. Many of the artists who were creating these kinds of representations and the writers who were writing about these cultures had never even left the United States, uh, had certainly never traveled to places as far as this. Orientalism had well-intended origins uh, in studying history and culture of the region that became known as the Orient, and they had major departments at many universities around the world. The problem with Orientalism came when those cultures were being objectified by Westerners. So regions as vast as North Africa, the Middle East, India, and Asia all came to be grouped together as Orientals and thought of and stereotyped as exotic, seductive, decadent, and deceptive through images like the one you see, ones you see here that focus more on harems and snake charmers and camel trains than people's day-to-day -day lives. Photographers also participated in creating this reality. These images have been loaned to us by a local collector named Willis Jones. Uh, he has a wonderful collection of uh, photographs, historic photographs from the Islamic world, um, so many that you could dig through them for days. But we've chosen a few to put on view upstairs that I hope you'll have time to take a look at closely because they're so interesting. These are very choreographed, created images. These photographers were not uh, what we would think of today as photojournalists. They were deciding how these people were posed. They were choosing their costumes. And if you look closely, you'll see that they're standing not in an actual piece of their society there. 
They're standing in front of backdrops. They were either painted or purchased by the photographer. In addition to images of the other, Westerners were also consuming material goods in the form of fine arts, decorative arts, and furnishings that were produced or influenced by Eastern cultures. Oriental rugs and Chinese porcelain abounded in American and European homes. And like most in, uh, cultural influences, the pattern was to collect and then solicit and eventually imitate. So the initial stages of our love affair with oriental motifs were when travelers or traders brought back items made in those regions for their native population, as you can see uh, with the Chinese vase here from the 18th century. But once people in those regions realized there was an active market in America and Europe, they began to produce objects specifically for export. And you can see an example of that with this Famille Rose plate. Eventually, once those uh, motifs became ubiquitous in American and European society, we have American and European makers and factories making things themselves in these Eastern motifs. So these pieces were made in America or Europe in an Eastern style. Of course, there is no crime in appreciating the beauty of another culture, and there's no crime in collecting objects from another culture. In fact, I think those are two of the most wonderful things that bring us all together. The problem comes with Orientalism when the exotic becomes an illusion that makes people seem different, other, or less. So how we consume culture today still has profound impacts uh, from the most welcome tourist dollars and the cultural revivals they sometimes facilitate to exploitation or stereotyping that can lead to problems. So culture, religion, and language are all fascinating and enriching and they fulfill our lives. The study of other people helps us understand that we are not universal, that we are sometimes the other. So tonight, I'd like to suggest that we all take our opportunities to consume culture, to look for similarities rather than differences. And as you can see from cultures around the world, everybody enjoys snacks and cocktails. <laughs> so I invite you to join me in the sculpture gallery to have some. Thank you.